and I'm going to turn this over to her. She can do a proper introduction of herself and give you all the information you need. If um, you have questions, if you could put them in the chat and then she can answer them as she's able. Beverly? All righty. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss Lyons. Good evening, um, everyone. My name is, I'm Beverly Coleman. I am the director of the Educational Opportunity Center. We are a pre-college program funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and we assist, um, we predominantly assist adults um, 19 and above. However, we can also assist high school seniors in pursuing post-secondary education. Um, I'm putting a link into our intake form now um, into the chat. And what that means is we provide assistance in admissions. Um, that's the application process, identifying schools. Um, although we are hosted by Montgomery College, we do not recruit for the college and we'll assist students no matter where they want to attend, um, including um, that we had a student prior to the pandemic uh, who was attending college in Canada. Um, so when I say we'll help you go wherever you want, our, our, our goal is not to tell you where to go. Our goal is to help you get there. Um, we also assist with financial aid, which includes uh, assistance with the FAFSA, the completion of the FAFSA, creating an FSA ID, the completion of financial aid forms that are required by the institution. Um, we also assist with the CSS profile. Um, there are many private schools that require the CSS profile, as well as there are some scholarships um, that use the CSS profile. And so we assist with the completion of that as well. Uh, I should mention that all of our services are free. They are offered in English and Spanish, as well as we can offer it in other languages if needed. Um, we also offer the GED practice test. So if you have family members or community members or someone you know that has not earned a high school diploma and who is interested in earning a GED, we do offer the GED practice test for free, um, one. And then two, if a person scores 145 or higher in any section, we will provide them with a GED voucher. Uh, one of the things I uh, neglected to mention is that we also help with the scholarship process. So we help people with not only identifying scholarships, but also making sure they understand what the application process is, what needs to be added, um, what documents are required, whether or not there is a letter of recommendation or reference, um, and just helping them navigate it. So it's not just identifying scholarships, but helping people navigate the application process. We provide academic um, counseling in that we provide uh, assistance because we predominantly serve low-income um, low first-generation uh, individuals. Uh, we provide information about post-secondary education, um, the terminology, the process, the resources to really make sure to help um, those uh, people, uh, young people that are adults that we're working with, making sure that they understand um, the post-secondary education um, because there's a difference between dropping a class and withdrawing from a class. And one can have a negative impact on your financial aid and the other won't. So just making sure that people understand all those things. We um, assist in career exploration. I know sometimes as a high school senior, you may feel you know what you wanna do um, with a, a career you're interested in and sometimes we're not sure. Um, and so one of the things we do is we offer career exploration to help people identify careers that may interest them, identify the training and ed or education that's required, where can I get that training or education, and how do I pay for it? Um, so we assist uh, individuals in that entire process. And, and as it relates to financial literacy, hopefully everyone's already seen our flyer because these are the programs on our flyer. Uh, resource services that we offer, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but we also, as it relates to financial li literacy, um, we assist those who may be in default of a federal student loan and helping them navigate, how do I get out of default um, so that I can be eligible for federal and state aid, as well as we assist those who have attended a, oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, we also, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to double task here. Um, we also work with those who have attended a for-profit institution and the for-profit institution went out of business while they were there and um, they borrowed they borrowed money. And then you can have what's called a loan discharge. Um, and so we assist um, individuals with navigating that process as to how do I apply for that loan discharge. Um, and we have had students who not only have had their loan discharged, but have also um, gotten refunds from the loan payments that they made. So um, I'm going to quickly share our flyer about our program. This is who we are. Um, and I also will put a link, a PDF link to it in the um, chat. And so these are the services that we provide. There we go. And we're hosted by Montgomery College. As you can see, admissions, financial aid, FAFSA, scholarship search, um, academic advising, career advising, and financial literacy. And um, the flyer is in English and Spanish. Um, our intake form is online and also in English and Spanish as well. Okay, but I'm gonna go back to that. I'm gonna copy the link and see if it allows me to enter that into the chat in Zoom. There it I'm is. sorry, I just wanted to interrupt very quickly because we do have one person who's in the breakout room. So uh, I, I'm realizing now that she's not getting the, um, the visual presentation. So oh. I just wanted to say out loud that so that our interpreter can can repeat it in Spanish that we will share the presentation um, by email tomorrow. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and I've shared the, hopefully they're getting the link because um, I've placed the, our flyer in the link, in the chat, uh, and that the chat, the, the flyer is in English and Spanish. Okay. All righty. And so we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, this evening, I'm going to talk about uh, financial aid. Um, there we go. Um, what did she say? Yeah, okay, the link is working great. All right, sorry, just trying to read what the person had written. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk about financial aid, the sources of financial aid. Um, there we go. Uh, what is cost of attendance, um, financial need, and Instead of expected family contribution, it's student aid index, um, categories and types, free application, and what is MHEC, which is Maryland Higher Education Commission. Um, we want to talk about all of the different resources, financial aid resources that are available um, to persons uh, to pay for college. Now, I did put, I'm going to put my link in the chat one more time, and that link is to our intake form. Whoops. Oh, no, I have a different link now. That's okay. No worries. No worries at all. Um, and our intake form, we serve a thousand participants annually. And so we are asking you to complete our intake form. Um, and the reason is, is because we are funded by the federal government. And the federal government it is not doing what I wanted to do. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can. There we go. It's making me have to copy it again. It's not let me.
Is that the bit.ly that you shared yes. that earlier? I'll reshare it for you. Oh, I got it. Thank you. There we oh, go. Okay. Uh, it wasn't allowing me to copy it. Sorry about that. Um, I did not expect that technology would be that uncooperative. Um, so anyhow, so we ask that people complete our intake form um, because what this session is um, as a service that we're providing, um, financial aid information, and this verifies for the federal government that there were people here um, that they completed the form, that we determined their eligibility for our services, um, and um, that we are doing exactly what uh, we say we're going to do in our grant. So, but if you have any questions about the about who we are, um, how we're funded, why we need the intake form, please feel free to ask that question. As Ms. Lyon said, you can put it in the chat, or if you like, um, and uh, Ms. Lyons will bring it to my attention. Um, but we are asking that the students, not the parents, um, complete the intake form. The parents only complete the intake form if they too would like um, to take some classes or are interested in our services, um, which are listed there on the flyer. And if you hear a cat, it's my daughter's cat. She's rather theatrical, so she sometimes will whine as if she's not been fed for days. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is money provided to a student or parents to assist in paying for post-secondary education. Um, so that means it's any money that is not provided by the family. Um, and find, and how that determines how much financial aid I receive, one is the cost of attendance. The cost of attendance um, has direct cost and indirect cost. The direct cost are those that are generally paid to the institution, which is tuition and fees, and then room and board if you're living on campus or have a meal plan. However, even if I'm attending a community college or if I'm not living on campus, um, I, room and board is still calculated into the cost of attendance. Indirect costs, those are costs that in the past, people only got their books from the bookstore and their supplies from there. Now students are getting their books and supplies from eBay, from Amazon, from Walmart, from Target. Um, and so people get their, their books and supplies in various places. Um, transportation, whether I live on campus and I'm going to be commuting home um, you know, once or twice a month, or if I'm going to be a commuter, um, such as at, at a community college, and I will be going back and forth to campus every day. Uh, and as well as personal living expenses, which includes having a cell phone, haircuts, occasional uh, social activities, such as getting a pizza. Um, so those are personal living expenses. Um, each school provides that information, the cost of attendance, and if you go into a college's website and you type in cost of attendance, you can see what the cost of attendance is at that school um, because it's always beyond the tuition and fees. Often people look at tuition and fees and don't look at all the other expenses. So it's important to keep all of that in mind. So student aid index, um, are there any parents or out there who have done a FAFSA previously who have had to submit one. If you can just indicate with a thumbs up, that would be wonderful. All right, I'm not seeing any thumbs up. Um, so that means that, oh, okay, so Mr. Resnick has. Um, so that means uh, what's different, that you will notice the difference with the FAFSA the 24-25 FAFSA. Those of you who've never done a FAFSA or submitted a FAFSA, you're not gonna notice the changes. So, so me saying student aid index to somebody who's never done a FAFSA, it doesn't seem any different. However, for Mr. Resnick it is, because he's used to the term EFC or expected family contribution. The student aid index will be used in the same way, it just has a different name. So these are the kinds of things that go into determining 
the student aid index. Uh, parent, parent income, and this is for de dependent students. Parent income, parent assets, student income and student assets. So if your child worked in 2022, then they will need to report their income on the 24-25 FAFSA. So it uses the two, um, the 20, the 24-25 FAFSA will use your 2022 income. However, it does have questions about the status of things today, but the income that is used is the 2022. They have different formulas based on the student status. And so is this a dependent student, which would be your children predominantly would be dependent students. Um, so that's the formula. Then there's an independent student with no dependents other than a spouse. So it's just me and my spouse. And then a dependent, independent student with dependents other than a spouse. So I may have a spouse, but I also have um, children or I have someone else that I provide more than 50% of the support for. And so they use different formulas in determining that student aid index, formerly the EFC. Again, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to post them in the chat. I just want to explain a little, and, and this is the same ex, Mr. Resnick may be familiar with this. Um, it's eligibility index for the number that a college or career school financial aid office uses to determine how much federal student aid the student would receive if the student attended. This number results from the information that's on the student FAFSA. So that information that's provided on there is what makes that determination for the student. Um, and because Mr. Resnick has submitted a FAFSA previously, one of the things um, I wanna make sure that he's aware of is with the new FAFSA, having multiple children in college will not be used to determine your student aid index. It was previously used to determine the EFC and could actually decrease the EFC, but that is something that will not be used. Um, so need-based money. So need-based um, uh, aid is based on the family financial situation. So based on the information that you've provided on the FAFSA, and I just want to make sure, although we don't work with students who are eligible for the MISFA, because all of our students must be U.S. citizens or be eligible to complete a FAFSA. Um, so they use, so the, it's the information that's uh, on your FAFSA to determine need. So if, so if it says it's a need-based scholarship, or a need-based grant. That means they're gonna base it on your FAFSA and that number, that student aid in index to determine if your student aid index meets the requirement for that need-based funds. And then non-need or merit-based scholarships as are more um, are not based on the family position um, the income that the family has, no matter how high or no, how low, it doesn't matter. Um, that is not taken in consideration in receiving merit-based aid. So if an institution says it's merit-based aid, then your income um, does not play a part in the deciding factor as to whether or not you will be awarded those funds. Um, often merit-based aid comes in academics, athletics, band, music, um, it can be any, a variety of things, but what's key is that it's merit-based and it's not based on family income. And therefore, um, even the Gates or um, anyone else of great wealth, um, could their children could still receive it if it's a merit-based scholarship. So these are four um, <clears throat> types of aid. So, uh, a financial aid. Scholarships. Um, scholarships can be something that you apply for, or it can be something that you're determined to be eligible for based on information that you've already provided. But those are scholarships and they are awarded. They do not have to be paid back. However, um, they may have requirements 
that a student may need to maintain in order to keep the scholarship. One of the things that you do want to make note of as your children are getting their award letters from college, um, which generally don't uh, doesn't happen until February, I'm not sure how the delay in the FAFSA is going to impact that, um, but they will say that sometimes it may be a freshman scholarship. Um, and so it may only be for the first year. So it's it really important that students and their families look over that award letter very carefully so that they're clear on what type of aid they received because you're not looking at just one year. Most students take five to six years to complete a bachelor's degree. And so you wanna make sure how long is this aid going to cover is it a four, is it a four year um, scholarship or is it a one year scholarship? So you just want to be very clear. So you're clear about budgeting for um, the college education. Grants, grants are need based funds. They are generally offered based on your FAFSA um, or your MISFA in the state of Maryland, um, and they are awarded and they are gift aid. Um, and because of that, uh, you do not pay a grant back. But again, with most grants, um, particularly if we're talking about federal or state grants, if students don't keep up their coursework and their grades and aren't completing enough classes, um, they can um, their aid can be terminated. Um, they can appeal to get it back, but it can be terminated. So it's really important that students are staying focused. Work study uh, is an employment program through the federal government in which students can receive federal work study. Um, and they, if they are awarded $5,000 for the year, $2,500 for the fall, $2,500 for the spring, um, and then they work to earn those dollars. Um, they can work in an office. Uh, they may work in a nonprofit. I often encourage students based on their major to see if they can find a work study a job that's in um, the department that they're interested in. And then there are loans. Um, and loans, I know, you know, many people figure that, feel that's a dirty word, but there are loans. And just so you know, parents and students, that most financial aid packages will, will include a loan. Um, and it's really important that students and families understand you can accept the loan or you can decline the loan. You don't have to accept everything in your award package. However, I encourage you to accept the scholarships, grants, and if you're interested in work study, um, but if you feel you don't need the loans to pay your uh, tuition and fees or uh, your college expenses, um, then you can decline the loan. Any questions? Um, and these are the sources of federal aid, of aid, excuse me, the federal government, the state government, and I will break down the, the funds from both the federal government and the state, um, private scholarships, and it, m funds from the college or universities. For example, Montgomery College offers, um, awards about $6 million in scholarships annually. And then there is the CSS profile. Uh, I don't know if any of the students out there are planning on applying to some of the schools that accept the student, the SSS profile, um, but I encourage you, if you are, that you complete the CSS profile. Um, make sure you check with online with, with the college's financial aid page, or you can go to the CSS profile. Go to this right here. Oh. And you can see the list of schools that um, use the CSS profile. Now, if you choose to, you can say, I don't feel like filling out another financial aid form. However, if you choose to do that, then what you'll be doing is preventing yourself from having access to the funds the college itself offers. Um, because the college is to use the CSS profile, that is how they use it. 
So I say check the list. If your school is on there, even if it's only one of the schools you're applying to, I encourage you to complete that. Um, and the EOC program can help you with that. Okay. All right. I haven't received any intake forms yet. So I'm going to just post. I see the. Oh, how to get work study. I didn't even see that question. Um, work study is something that is offered to students. Um, it'll be a part of their financial aid package. They don't have to. Um, Mr. Resnick may remember when he, when, whenever his children completed the FAFSA that you had to answer the question that said, uh, would you like to be considered for, are you interested in work, interested in work study? They no longer ask that question. Um, if you are eligible for work study, it is a need-based program. And I think sometimes when I say need, uh, people may have different understandings of that. Um, but Work study is goes up to middle income families. Um, and so you may be able, uh, they may be offered work study. Um, so you don't have to say yes or no or anything on the financial aid application on the FAFSA at all. Um, if you're eligible for it, it will be offered to you. One and two, you can always, uh, once you've submitted your FAFSA, you can always reach out to the institution's financial aid office and ask them about work study. Uh, the students at Montgomery College are paid $15.67 an hour, and it's going up to 16 something um, in January. Now, that's just so you know, how much a student makes in work study is really based on the location of the institution. So for Montgomery College, because we are in Montgomery County, and therefore that is the minimum wage, and so the work study students make the minimum wage. Somewhere else in which they've not increased the minimum wage, um, they may only be making eight or $9 an hour. So I would encourage you, if you're offered work study, that you also ask about that. The benefit or the disadvantage is if a student's offered 15, excuse me, 5,000 in work study, if I am being paid $15 um, dollars an hour, that's going to equal to fewer hours that I can work than if I am paid only $10 an hour. But work study is always a great opportunity, particularly for those students who may not have work experience. Um, I often, with our work study students, uh, they use me as a reference um, and, I've, and that's helped them to get various jobs. Free application for federal student aid. And the reason I put this up here, because people often say FAFSA, but they're not clear what that acronym stands for. It's the free application for federal student aid. And the operative word here is free. There is no fee to submit it. And you can get assistance at no cost in completing it. Our, our program will assist you for free in completing the FAFSA. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is a few years back, there was a organization uh, that if you put in FAFSA and if you only typed in FAFSA, they popped up first. However, when you submitted the form, you were uh, had to pay for submission. And that's why I always wanna make sure, just in case another organization does that, that people know that submitting the FAFSA is free. There is no cost to it. However, one of the things you'll need to do is you will need to create a student, um, um, excuse me, an FSA ID, a federal student aid ID. Um, both the student and both parents will need an FSA ID. They are making some changes about whose income needs to be reported on the FAFSA. And so we are encouraging parents, both, well, what, both parents have to go on there, I mean, both parents, if you're married, um, need an FSA ID. And if you're divorced or separated, we're still encouraging both parents to get an FSA ID um, because of some of the changes they're making about whose income goes on there. 
Um, and I know the FAFSA is not open right now, um, has not been released, is scheduled to be released in December. However, in the meantime, you can make sure that you have your FSA IDs. If you already have one, you can make sure that you have the right password um, so that when the FAFSA is open, you have everything in order so that you can complete your FAFSA. And this is how you can use your account. Um, with parents, you're using one, um, to sign it, and um, two, to retrieve your information from your income tax, from your federal, uh, from your 1040. Um, also, I know some families share a, they don't share social security numbers, of course, but they share a mobile number or they may share an email address. With the FSA ID, each person has to have their own email address and their own phone number. Um, the same phone number cannot be used for uh, two individuals. It has to be separate. A little bit more information. It collects demographic and financial information. Um, it's used to collect expected family contribution, SAI. Um, the colleges use SAI. SAI I'm getting used to saying SAI, um, to offer financial aid. And the 2425 FAFSA will be available in 11 languages. Are there any questions? So uh, that's just letting you know that the 2425 FAFSA is scheduled to be released in December of this year. Um, we have not been given a date, um, but as soon as we are, we will be uh, promote, you know, putting information out so that people know when it's going to be released. These are the removals of the uh, family member number of family members in college for eligibility calculation. Um, that the SAI um, can be a negative number of a minimum of. My, uh, negative 1,500, and that's instead of zero. Elimination of EFCs for enrollment for a period other than nine months. Um, and then elimination of the simplified needs test and the automatic zeros calculation. Um, and so there was a, what would happen is based on your income and other information, it would become an automatic zero. They've eliminated that. So one of the things that uh, FAFSA is used for is to determine your Pell eligibility. So um, full Pell for this year is $7,395. Uh, and the way that's used, half of that is for the fall and half of that is for the spring. And you can see that if you do the math, that it is not enough for a four-year institution. However, it is enough for tuition and fees if you're a county resident for a community college. However, if I'm not taking 12 credits and this is being eligible for full Pell, if I'm eligible for full Pell and if I'm not taking six, I mean, excuse me, I'm not taking 12 credits, then that I it's prorated based on the number of credits that you're taking. So if I'm taking six credits, I would get half of that. Um, the at the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Now with Pell, if you're eligible, as long as you meet the last deadline, which is June 30th of 2025, if you're eligible, you'll receive it. That is not the same with the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, also referred to as the SEOG. Colleges receive that money, they award that money to those with the highest need who complete their FAFSA the earliest. Um, once that money runs out, it's gone. Where with Pell, if you're eligible, you will receive it. There is a teacher, all of these are from the federal government. There's a teacher assistance um, grant, which is up to $4,000 um, a year. And with that, if I decide, and it has a service agreement. So if I decide I don't wanna teach or I don't wanna teach a subject or I don't wanna teach in the area, 
that becomes a loan. So that's important that people understand that. So you can't get the money and then decide, I don't want to be a teacher. Um, it becomes a loan. Uh, again, I've talked about work study um, and then student loans. Uh, student loans come in subsidized and unsubsidized. Uh, the, un the subsidized means that the interest does not accrue while the student is enrolled for at least six credits. The unsubsidized, the interest begins to recruit, accrue about 90 days after it's in the student's account. You can have an unsubsidized um, loan deferred, um, but you want to think about, about the interest accruing. And the student, the parent plus loan, which is another loan that will allow parents to borrow up to the cost of attendance um, after any aid has been applied. Uh, that is an unsubsidized loan and uh, it's determined, eligibility for that is determined on credit rating. Um, and it's, you don't have to have a high credit score or what, what one might consider a high credit score. So here's some money. So we've talked about the federal government funds. There's also money from the state. Um, there's the Howard P. Rawlings Guaranteed Access Grant and the Education Assistance Grant. The Guaranteed Access Grant, if you notice, it's $20,000, $20,700. And that is for the 23-24 school year. To be eligible for that, a student must be uh, meet the uh, generally income requirements, generally around the range for free or reduced lunch, and the student must have a 2.5 GPA at the end of the second marking period of their senior year. Um, that money can only be used in state. It cannot be taken out of state. Uh, and then we have the Educational Assistance Grant, which is a grant for middle-income um, families about that range of middle income. One of the benefits is when they determine the calculation for that, uh, they take into consideration the cost of living for the various areas in determining eligibility. However, the educational assistance grant can run out of money. So you wanna make sure that you submit your FAFSA early. Uh, there's also a part-time grant from the state of Maryland However, you have to speak to the financial aid office at your institution in order to determine for them to determine if you're eligible. Remember, all of this eligibility is also based on the information you provided on your FAFSA. And Ms. Lyons, because of the way my screen is, if the chat, if there, I don't think there's anything in the chat, but if I miss anything, please let me know. We do have a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Then yeah. I will stop. Um, I'll read them to you and then Thank you. answer. So the first question is, what happens if this children's father is not in their life, but they do have share the parents do have shared custody? Um well, one of the things that they changed um with the new FAFSA, um, it's not so much about custody, um, but it it's who provides the greatest financial support. And that's what determines if there if the father's inform if, if the other parent, the non-custodial parent, well, you have joint custody, but um if the other parent's income has to go on there. I, I should say the parent with whom the the children don't live with uh primarily. So um, so that information would determine that. Who provides the most financial support? Then the next question is, what threshold is considered need-based? Should the FAFSA be filled out regardless of need for scholarship purposes? Yes. They can, yes, you should, because many scholarships will require, even merit-based scholarships will require that you've completed a FAFSA. Um, and they use that for data collection, but yes, you still want to complete a FAFSA, um, one, and yes, you do want to fill it out every year because, 
um, you don't want to assume that they're that you're not eligible for something because it's not just income that goes in there. It's income, it's assets, it's number in the household. So there's other information that goes into creating that student aid index. Um, and I always encourage people, let them tell you what you're eligible for, as opposed to you determining that you're not eligible for something. Um, particularly since, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the, is there anything else, Ms. Lyons? Not at the moment. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these legislative scholarships. The legislative scholarships are awarded by our state, your state senator and your state delegates. Um, and of course, they are familiar with the cost of living in uh, Montgomery County. Um, and sometimes and, and they can take that in consideration in awarding you a scholarship. Now, the reality is you have to apply for them. Um, you have to, the students have to identify who their state senator is, their state delegates are. Um, they need to contact them via email um, and ask for the application process. Our program, if you join us, we have a template of an email um, so that we can make sure that students are using the proper uh, acknowledgement when referring to a senator or a delegate. Um, and I know I told this to the group that I met with individually. We had a student we were working with that said, oh, I got this. They didn't, um, they were actually emailing a state senator. They referred to them as a state delegate. And the education aide never replied with the information. So you want to be very careful to make sure that your students, your children are using a proper terminology when referring to the state senator and state delegates. And this link here, um, we didn't um, get to do that. We had so many questions last night. Um, this link here, if I put in, right there, there we go. See, the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, our U.S. senators, the U.S. representative. And then you see there's your state senator. And uh, there are three delegates. So you would want to contact all of them and apply for all of them because you can receive money from the state senator and the delegate. Uh, the other one is the workforce shortage. Um, oh, one thing I do want to make sure I mention is March 1st, uh, because I'm not handing out all the information I was in person. Uh, March 1st is the deadline to submit your FAFSA to be considered for state aid, to be, be considered from money from Maryland Higher Education Commission, including the legislative scholarships. So you want to make sure that you submit your FAFSA um, by March 1st. If you submit it March 2nd, it will be too late and you will not be considered. The workforce shortage um, scholarship is for specific uh, workforce shortage areas, which include child care, physical therapy assistant, physical therapist, occupational therapy assistant, occupational therapist, nursing, um, and public safety. Um, and they can be changed. So it's always important to check that out because they can be changed based on what areas, what um, workforce areas are their shortages. There also is the Community College Promise Scholarship, which is for, um, it's a last, it's called a last dollar scholarship. So um, it's, it's given. It's only for community colleges. Um, if you're attending a community college, if your child is attending a four-year institution, this does not pertain to them, and they would not be eligible to receive this. Um, and it won't even show up on their award if they don't list a community college on their FAFSA. So the community college promise scholarship, um, you can get up to two thousand dollars, and it is. Um, 
I'm sorry, up to $3,000. Um, I'm thinking of uh, many scholarships. I've been doing a lot of presentations lately, so I apologize for that. Um, but up to $3,000 and the student uh, has to be attending a community college. A uh, single parent household is up to, parent can make up to 100,000 and a two parent household can make up to 150,000. Um, I don't know if they're going to increase those salary, those incomes um, amounts for the 24, 25 year. They have not updated their information on the Maryland Higher Education website. Uh, and then there also is a teaching fellows uh, of Maryland scholarship. Um, if any of your children are planning on becoming teachers. There are some tuition waivers as well in the state of Maryland. Um, so the tuition waivers means that the person who receives it is not charged for tuition. The, the cost of tuition is waived. They do have to pay for their fees and books and other things, but not the tuition. The tuition is waived. And that is um, at public schools only. Uh, the foster care recipients are for those who were in foster care at age 18 or when they graduated high school, whichever came first. The unaccompanied homeless youth is for any youth uh, who is uh, homeless or unaccompanied. Uh, and those are up to age 24 that you can apply for that. Um, after that, um, you're not, you, as long as you started before age 24, you're fine. Uh, there is also a waiver for Maryland National Guard, as well as a waiver for students with disabilities in order to be eligible for that, you must be receiving SSI or SSDI, and you must be attending a community college. So remember all that state money I talked about? Well, in order to make sure that your child can receive it and claim it, they must create what's called an MDCAP. So for the federal government, it's an FSA ID for the student and parents. For the state, only the student needs to create an MD caps. And this is how, this is the information that goes in there. One of the key things to remember is that the MHEC, Maryland Higher, Maryland Higher Education Commission, um, matches your information from your FAFSA to what you've indicated here. So that means if your name is Robert, you don't, and that's what you have on your FAFSA, you use Robert in here, even if you go by Bobby or something else. One, two, the social security number and then the date of birth. Those are the your name, your social security number and your date of birth are the three identifiers that Maryland Higher Education Commission uses to match you to your FAFSA. So it's really important that you are um, providing the correct information on both. Um, because I've seen students where it's not matching, and if it doesn't match, if you're not, if you're eligible for fun for money, you will not receive it because they can't connect you to the FAFSA. Beverly, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Before you move too much forward, um, there was a question about the waivers you were talking about. Yes, it says do these waivers include room and board? Only tuition. There are only tuition waivers for tuition only. However, for those who we are eligible for the foster care or the homeless youth waiver. Um, they are uh, supposed to be given first a priority consideration for housing at four-year institutions, but it does not waive those costs. Okay. Again, you wanna complete this by March 1st. The other thing, thank you for the question. The other thing that I want you to keep in mind is when the 2425 FAFSA is released. When you log on, you will see two FAFSAs there. One will be the 2425, one will be the 2324, which is the year that we're in now. Make sure your student selects the 2425. If they select and submit the 2324 FAFSA, when MHEC receives it, they will assume they are not a high school senior. And therefore, what will happen that they are not a high school senior for the um, for the twenty four twenty five application, 
And what happens is that guaranteed access grant, you have to be a high school since senior. If you do the 2324, you won't be considered for it. So it's really important that students are being very attentive to that. And then also after you um, complete your MD caps, um, you'll have to verify it as well. And then once you complete it, this is what you can get access to. Uh, so we come down here to um, your awards payment, I mean awards, um, and you check that and the awards will tell you what exactly um, you need, uh, what you're being offered and what documents you need to provide. Um, and you can electronically upload those documents. And I need to update this one because that's an old one. Um, and you can electronically update. Now, what will happen is you will, the student, not the parent, the student will receive an email from MHEC saying that um, you're being considered. I forget the exact wording they use, um, but it's telling the student to go check their MD caps. They only give you a limited time to sometimes two to three weeks to check that. So if you choose to, oh, I'll do it later and later never comes, you will have you can miss out on that money because you've not submitted the documents and the time frame they requested them. So don't miss out on money by not taking care of that. Because I've had students who, uh, whatever, I don't want to do that. And they now and they didn't receive the money. Also, um, you know, there are scholarship opportunities. Um, Ms. Lyons has great access to lots of scholarship opportunities. You want to be applying for them. Um, there are some scholarships that get very limited applications or sometimes no qualified applicants. Um, and that also even happens with the legislative scholarships. Um, and so it's important that students are reaching out to and getting access and applying for all those scholarships that they meet the eligibility criteria for. Um, colleges and universities, their financial aid office. You can go to the website of any college or university you're interested in, go to the financial aid website, and there you can find out about scholarship opportunities. Um, and then um, private organizations, employers, and civic organizations. So if your children work, Chick-fil-A, offers a scholarship, your children work at Chick-fil-A. Um, I always encourage students that where their parents work, they may offer a scholarship. Um, so begin asking questions about scholarships. And I always think that, and I believe that right now is a great time to be looking at scholarships until the FAFSA uh, open, um, is released. So it's not like you're just sitting on your thumbs waiting for the FAFSA to be released. You can be working on scholarships, creating an FSA ID, and creating your MD caps. And there are um, internet searches as well um, that you can use in order to seek out scholarships. One of the things I encourage students to do when you're doing scholarship searches, make sure you're looking at one, what are the eligibility criteria? Do I meet the eligibility criteria? Two, if it's an essay, do, do I enjoy writing? Because what you don't want to do is collect a whole bunch of scholarships that you know you're not going to apply for um, because it has a, requires a 500-word essay or and maybe some other thing that you're not interested in doing. Only select the scholarships that you're actually going to complete. Uh, there are scholarships based on your career. As I said, check for your parents' employer. Civic organizations, such as the NAACP, the Rotary, the Seroptimus, and House of Worship. Um, houses of Worship also um, frequently have funds. So seek out and find out whether or not those, there are scholarships available. And then apply if you're interested. Now, sometimes students will th say, well, I don't want to apply for it. It's only $500. $500 can pay for a semester of books, depending on your major. $500 means that's $500 less that you and your family have to come up with. 
So I believe all scholarships count. Um, this is the contact information um, for the federal government. Um, if you have any questions, Um, and these are two websites. The top one um, is so that you can get all the information you would like about the new FAFSA. Um, and then the second is the college scorecard, which uh, I encourage students and parents to look at um, because it provides information from the Department of Education about the institutions um, in the country, in the US. So that you can look up any institution, find out what their graduation rate is, their debt rate, um, how many students get financial aid, um, as well as the in average income that their students make as well. Now, be careful when you look at North Carolina, well, they, they don't have his income in, that, in there anymore, but uh, Michael Jordan of the anthropology department at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, would always say that he messed up their <laughs> average income for uh, anthropology because he was an anthropology major, but we all know he was not an anthropologist. Uh, and so some students thought they could make that much as anthropologists. And this is the contact information for Maryland Higher Education Commission if you should have any questions or any problems and um, the MDCAPS system link so that your students can create their MDCAPS. It's better to have these things done already. And then this is our contact information. Um, I, I will ask one more time. I will uh, put the link in one more time for our intake form. And you, we will be sharing the slideshow with me so I can send it. I won't. If they, if they would like to slideshow, I need them to complete an intake form. Okay. So that yeah. that was yeah. that question was just asked. So yeah. will you share it automatically with the people who have completed the intake? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Because we have to serve a thousand participants annually. Um, and... Um, so we need to be making sure that we're not giving away the service um, that the federal government says we are to provide. Okay, are there other questions? Please feel free to unmute yourselves at this point if you would like to just ask a question out loud. Can I speak please? We can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so for first time ever FAFSA parents, is there is a slide or something to tell us in steps what to do? Like now I know my homework is to look for uh, other scholarships before the FAFSA open in December. So this is step one and then this is step two. During December to March, what should be done in steps? I know yeah. it's a lot, but mm -hmm. I don't know which one to start. Well, Sorry. one, you also want to make sure, I don't know if this is the student or the parent. Um, Sounds like I'm it. a parent. Yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't do much for my first child. Um, he couldn't apply for anything. And so he's just staying home. So hopefully I can make better for the second child. Well, we'll actually, and is your, is your uh, first child still in college or did they enroll in college? No, he just skipped everything, stayed home. Well, if he's interested in going to college, we can help him. That's what I've just learned today. Thank you, Ms. Beverly. Yeah, we, yes. yeah, we can we can still help him. Um, we've helped people. I had a woman come in who was 70 years old who wanted to get her GED so she could go to college. So we'll help, as long as you're on this side of the soil, we'll help you. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things. You want to make sure that parents and students create their FSA ID now. Go ahead and create it. Some people are going to wait till the last minute, but go ahead and create your FSA ID um, of student and parents. Students, go ahead and create your MD caps. Um, also, there is some other information that I will be sharing as well 
um, some updates from the federal government. Um, and they are scheduled to have that FAFSA ready in, well, released in December. Make sure, another thing you can do, make sure you know where your 2022 taxes are. So if you had someone else complete them, make sure you know where your electronic copy of, if they re if you received electronic copy. Um, if you use TurboTax, make sure you know how to access that. Have all of that information ready. Um, make sure you understand what assets you have. If you have a business, um, if you have any investments, make sure you have that information or know where to get it quickly. Because that way, when the FAFSA is open, you'll have all the information that you'll need. And and um, and that makes the FAFSA easier. Um, and I believe Ms. Lyons is, when it comes open, you're going to have us come back to provide hands-on assistance completing the FAFSA. Is that correct? I would love to do that. Yeah. And what we do like is it. when we provide the hands-on assistance, um, Ms. Lyons, what we do is we provide you one- with the instructions on the FSA ID in case anyone hasn't created it yet. And then two, the list of documents that they are going to need. So for example, if your student has a license, they'll need to make sure they have their license or a picture of it so they can indicate their license number. Um, if the student has an alien, um, an alien registration number, they need to make sure that they have that um, available. And I please do not guess at what it is. I've had I had a student who guessed um, it was guessed at, it was guessed wrong. And then that slowed down the process for him because that meant he had to come in with his actual green card, but unfortunately had recently lost it, which slowed down his process by months. So make sure that um, when it comes to social security number, Anything like that, that you're taking it right off the card. Um, so making sure you have all of that information together now is what I would encourage. Um, want to also, check to see if any of the schools your children are interested in applying to require the CSS profile. The CSS profile is open. It opened up October the 1st. So you can also be completing that as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions, Ms. Lines? Or... No, no more questions in the chat. Before everybody leaves, I did want to share the things on my website that I shared last night, but I'll wait till the very end. If everyone could just stick around a little bit longer. Beverly, you're muted. I, I was muting myself because I was all ready for you to start talking. And I didn't <laughs> want to hear people hear shadow keep crying. <laughs> But um, uh, I don't have anything else to add. Um, if you are interested in getting help with search, scholarship searches, we can assist you with that. If you need to complete the CSS profile, um, we assist with that as well. And thank you very much. All right. So if you are done, if you could stop sharing, and then I would like to share just a few resources with you guys. Give me just one moment. So if you, I will, let me do this. Oops. Okay. I'm going to show you how to get to this. So if you go to the Magruder High School website, you don't have to do this right now, but just I'm showing you how to get to the what, I'm, what I want to share. And then click here on college and career. This is my website and you can see there is an entire section on financial aid and scholarships. I strongly urge you to take a look at these pages. Uh, there are so many resources there for you. And then the other one that I wanted to show you, whoops, is the events calendar page. I try to announce all of these, but you see that there are a lot of events coming up Many of them might be of interest or helpful to you. Regarding scholarships, you'll see there's one coming up here on November 9th. 
that is going to be facilitated by a scholarship search uh, website slash organization uh, called Going Mary, which I think is possibly the best scholarship search website I've ever seen. It is so comprehensive and so intuitive and user-friendly. It's fantastic. So I strongly encourage you to attend that webinar if you, if you can. There is a registration link there. And there are also recordings of past events. And I also have them in spreadsheet form. So um, thank you everyone so much for coming tonight. I hope this was helpful to everyone. And you know where to find me if you need me. And if you need Miss Coleman and you didn't get her contact information, I will be happy to share that as well. So I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you, Jennifer. Good night and thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Beverly.